I'll explain the meaning of this verse and then we'll move forward. So this is Kapivara Santata Samsmrita Rama. Kapivar is, Kapi is a monkey, that is, Kapivar is the best of the monkeys, is Hanuman. Kapivara Santata Samsmrita Rama. Always, constantly, they were remembering Santata Samsmrita Rama. They were constantly, the monkeys were remembering Lord Ram. And what did Lord Ram do in return? Tadgati. On their path, Vigna, Vigna is obstacle, Dhamsaka, Dhamsaka is the Lord reciprocated with their remembrance by removing obstacles from their path, Dhamsaka Rama, such as the Lord Ram that we glorify. So let's begin with some, our prayers before that. Om Jnanati Mirandhasya Jnananjini Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Shri Mate Bhakti Vedanta Swami Itinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Vancha kalpataru bhyascha krupa sindhu bhyayevacha patita nam pavane bhyo vaishnave bhyo namo namaha jai shri krishna chaitanya prabhu nityananda shri advaita gadadhara shri vasadi gaura bhakta vrinda hare krishna hare krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare There's another device in that. Can you just check that? So just a minute. Sorry for the delay. So let's just recite this verse quickly and then we'll discuss something about Lord Ram today. So these are two names of Lord Ram, Kapivara, Kapivara as I said the best of monkeys, Santata, always Samsmruta, Samsmruta is remember, Kapivara, Santata, Samsmruta, Rama, Tad Gati, on their path, their progress, Vigna. Vigna is obstacle. Dhamsaka. Dhamsaka is to destroy. So the basic is the basic is the principle of bhakti that when we remember the Lord, the Lord destroys the obstacles on our path. Kapivara Santata Samsmrita Rama. Samsmrita Rama. Tadgati Vigna Dhamsak Rama Dhamsak Rama Kapivara Santata Samsmrita Rama Santata Samsmrita Rama Tadgati Vigna Dhamsak Rama Kapivara Santata Samsmrita Rama Santata Samsmrita Rama Tadgati Vigna Dhamsak Rama Dhamsak Rama Kapivara Santata Samsmrita Rama 
तद्गति विघ्न ध्वंसक राम ध्वंसक राम वंस मो लेट अस ट्राई टू डू इट ऑल टुगेदर इफ पॉसिबल कपिवर संतत संस्मृत राम तद्गति विघ्न ध्वंसक राम कपिवर संतत संस्मृत राम तद्गति विघ्न ध्वंसक राम लास्ट टाइम कपिवर संतत संस्मृत राम तद्गति विघ्न ध्वंसक राम थैंक यू so i'll talk about lord ram today from three perspectives i'll talk about from a the distinctiveness about of lord ram from the broad vedic perspective then i'll talk about from the vaishnava perspective and then we'll see what is the if there's any significance of lord ram within our particular tradition in the gaudiya vaishnava perspective Mm-hmm. So, we'll try in that way. Try to take a closer and closer look at Lord Ram. <clears throat> Now, the concept of avatar is the idea that there is a higher world, there is a spiritual world, and there is a material world. And from this higher world, the Lord descends down to this world. That descent is called as avatar. so it's like there are clouds in the sky with lots of rain but on the earth if there is a severe lack of water there's a drought then when the rain comes then water becomes available on the earth so like that the spiritual world is filled with with the flood with the abundant water of krishna consciousness of god consciousness whereas the material world is like a there is a drought of krishna consciousness over here drought of divine consciousness so when the avatar comes the avatar beings like a rain of divine consciousness and this avatar there are many different avatars who come into this material world at different times and among the various avatars each of them has their own mission that is there is so we, each avatar on one side has a universal mission and then there is a specific mission so the universal mission is described in the bhagavad gita that at one side one level there is to establish dharma hmm? that to establish order in the world and for establishing the order the lord does two things the empowers those who are virtuous paritranaya sadhuna and then he disempowers he sometimes the disempowerment may even involve destroying them those who are vicious but along with that so this is described in 4.7 and 8 in the bhagavad gita dharma samsthapana arthaya but along with that there is another mission of the lord which is to inspire love in the heart prem that is uh, so generally in the broad hindu tradition the words dharma samsthapana arthaya sambhavami yuga yuga is very widely quoted if you look at shri prabhupad's works shri prabhupad quotes the next verse janma karma ch me divyam much more that krishna comes not just to ins- establish order in this world that is definitely there but sakale neha mahata yogo nashta parant pa by the power of time the order of this world will give way to disorder eventually the ultimate the enduring purpose of the lord when he when there is a descent actually the descent of the lord there is a divine descent and that is meant to inspire the human ascent the rising of the human consciousness so when we hear the past times of the lord when we understand how loving and how glorious he is then by that we become attracted towards him and we become attracted towards him then krishna says naiti mameti that person comes to me attains me 
So that to inspire love in the heart through bhakti that culminates in love, that is described in 4, 9 and 10. So we could say this is the, so to establish dharma in the world, to inspire prema in the heart. So we could say this is almost like a, you could have an inverted funnel. That dharma is for all of society. Now prema or bhakti culminating in prema, that is for those people who are seeking it. Krishna, devotion or love cannot be forced. It needs to be inspired. So the dharma is established. And bhakti and prema are inspired. Now this is the common purpose of all avatars. Now specifically when the Lord descends to the world, at that time, each avatar has a particular purpose. Now we could say that when Lord Ram descended, who was the demon, who, who was the vicious person who had to be disempowered? That is Ravan. Yes, so, and then the Lord freed the pious people from his clutches. The devtas appealed to him. Now that is definitely there. So that's a, that's like a specific application of that universal purpose. But along with that, there is something more going on over there. It's also that if we look at the Valmiki Ramayana, the Valmiki Ramayana, each book has its own driving question. So for example, the Bhagavatam, its driving question is that, what, what is the question that is being answered throughout the Bhagavatam? What is the duty of someone who wants to die? Yes, so duty at death. Now, the Gita is a part of the Mahabharata and the Gita's question is about duty, dharma in general. That's why the question that Arjuna asks Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita when he surrenders, Pruchami Tvam Dharma Sammudha Chetaha. I want to know what is dharma. Now if we go to the Ramayana, the Ramayana also is a similar deliberation. It begins with Valmiki Muni asking Narad Muni, who is his guru, that who is an ideal person? What are the characteristics of an ideal person? So the idea is the same principle of duty or dharma, but here it's more specifically in terms of attributes and examples. What are the characteristics of an ideal person and what is the example of such a person who is ideal? So now in response to this, Narad Muni tells a brief story of Lord Ram. He gives a summary of his pastimes. And then Valmiki will be, just like in the Bhagavatam, it's described that after hearing in chapters 4th, 5th and 6th of the Bhagavatam, Narad Muni speaks to Vyasadev and then Vyasadev enters in your Samadhi. Samadhina Anusmaran. Anusmaram Vicheshtitam. He remembers the Lord's pastimes and then the Bhagavatam unfolds. So something similar happens in the Ramayana. So he hears the core pastimes, the summary, and Valmiki Muni enters into a trance and he then speaks the pastime. So the whole in one sense, the purpose of the Ramayana is to demonstrate how one can stick to dharma, how one can do the right thing even amid difficult situations. So, so each, so because of this specific purpose within the Ramayana, now I'm talking here specific in terms of the Valmiki Ramayana. The Valmiki Ramayana's purpose is to demonstrate the character of an ideal person. So sometimes when there is a movie, here right now we have Hollywood, hundreds of movies are produced. Sometimes some he movie is like a one person show, one hero or one heroine, and that person carries the whole movie and everybody else is just like an extra. But some movies in which every character has their own personality, their own backstory. Every character is fascinating. And when that happens, the story becomes even more absorbing. 
you could say the illusion becomes better in one sense but the point is that especially a movie is considered good when it is when it doesn't just depend on one person when the supporting cast they are also very very well played their characters are well written so like that if you see this book is called ramayan but in ramayan every character is special undoubtedly lord ram is the center but it's not like lord ram is the show stealer is that lord ram he is extraordinary but even the character of sita is extraordinary the character of lakshman is extraordinary and among the various books of the ramayan the sections of the ramayan the most popular is the sundar kand sundar kand is where hanuman goes in search of lanka goes to lanka or in search of sita and his adventures are described and the significance of this particular story is the verse which we we recited that is depicting the sundar kand so what happens is in this sundar kand it is the most popular part of the ramayan and yet lord ram is least present in this so how it happens is right at the beginning hanuman is sent by lord ram lord ram gives him a signet he says if you find sita show this to her then she will know that you are a authentic messenger sent by me and then after that it's hanuman's adventures he's searching for sita he's becoming a natural leader of the group hanuman is not appointed as the leader of the group who is going angada the son of the previous king wali is the leader at uh, many times nowadays in leader in management circle leadership circle they talk about like authority without influence sorry like influence without authority like if some you don't have an authority position but how do you acquire influence so hanuman does that and the lord gives him intelligence at various times to do that and then again lord ram appears at the end when hanuman comes back and reports that he has found sita and lord the lord embraces him so in the so apart from this hanuman is not present much in the most popular section of the sundar kand so sorry ram, ram, sorry ram is not present sorry sorry i guess my intelligence is not present now <laughs> thank you so so now i was talking from a vedic perspective the concept of avatar it is meant to inspire the human ascent so i'm telling so the human ascent is what it is not just that the lord does wonderful things the lord empowers hanuman to do wonderful things and we will discuss this theme a little later again but the point is when we devote ourselves to the lord it is some people feel that okay if i become devoted i'm chanting krishna's names i am glorifying him what about me you know do i lose my individuality do i lose my personality no not at all actually our purest our noblest our highest side starts manifesting and the more hanuman tries to serve the lord the more he starts becoming more and more powerful so the vedic understanding is the lord descends to this world now the idea of avatar is accepted even in the impersonalist traditions but their idea is avatar is just like a temporary or a convenient illusion to come out of illusion hmm? but in the vaishnava understanding the avatar so i'm moving from the vedic perspective to the vaishnava perspective now because the mood of bhakti comes more in the vaishnava perspective that the avatar descends to inspire love in the heart and the bhakti that is inspired that is eternal it is not at all temporary it is not that we have bhakti till we become liberated there are there are many retellings of the ramayan that have been told from a impersonalist perspective also because the ramayan in india became so popular over time that different people started using the ramayan 
to try to promote their own agendas. So the impersonalists retold the Ramayana in such a way that, okay, ultimately Ram merged into the Brahman. Mm -hmm. There is there is another retelling of the Ramayana called the Jain Ramayana. So the Jain Ramayana, what it is? Jainism is a relatively small but influential religion in India. Influential because Jains are known to be quite wealthy. But now these Jains, they retold the whole Ramayana. More or less the story is the same. But what they did in that is, when Lord Ram is in the forest, throughout he is meeting various Jain sadhus. And they are giving him instructions. And then at the end, when Sita enters into the earth and returns to where she has come from, then they say Ram becomes enlightened and embraces Jainism. <laughs> so everybody tries to portray things from their perspective. This is called as like mis misappropriation of tradition or appropriation of a tradition by some other tradition. But so that's why I'm differentiating the, in the Vedic understanding. There are Lord Ram is understood in many different ways, but the Ramayana itself is a Vaishnava book. And the Vaishnava understanding, the love between the Lord and the devotee is eternal. And that's why uh, when uh, this particular theme is focused on that bhakti is about inspiring, empowering the devotees. So what, on a, I'll talk about two incidents which illustrate this dynamism of Hanuman and Ram. Hanuman in one sense is the quintessential servant. Shri Prabhupada said that for the spreading of our movement, now we need Brahmanas with a Kshatriya spirit. We need Brahmanas, means people who are thoughtful, philosophical, intellectual. But if somebody is only a Brahmana, no, they will just be satisfied with their own thoughts. Okay, if somebody come, wants to come and learn about the thoughts, that, that, okay, you can come and learn. But if you don't want, I won't bother about you. So in general, what happens is, Brahmanas and Kshatriyas. So Brahmanas are concerned more about inner change. They are concerned about improving their thoughts, thinking higher, learning better. Now, oh, Brahmanas are important in society. But if they are only Brahmanas, now we are talking here about Brahmanas not at all by birth, but by attributes. Hmm? Now, Kshatriyas are concerned about outer change. Hmm? Kshatriyas want to improve things in the world. Now, of course, they also want inner change. But they want to make outer change in a way that inner change will become easier. So now, for them, they want to improve things. Now, if Srila Prabhupada, of course he was a Vaishnava, but if he had just been Brahmana wanting to improve thoughts, he could have just lived in Vrindavan. Prabhupada left Vrindavan at an advanced stage to come to America. Why? Because he wanted to follow his spiritual master's instruction and create change in the world. If the whole world cannot become spiritualized, at least there will be oasis in the spiritual world where those who want relief from the desert can be there. So that same mood of like a Brahman and a Kshatriya spirit. Hanuman is a quintessential devotee. Like that Hanuman is often shown with folded hands, but within those folded hands, in between them there is a mace. You may have seen that picture. So the idea is the folded hands convey bhakti and the mace conveys shakti. So, bhakti is that inner devotion. Shakti is the power to bring about an outer change. That's very similar. If Prabhupada said Brahmana with a Kshatriya spirit. So, the, for a devotee to actually bring about change in the world, that there is an inner and outer. That inner vigor is required for purifying our hearts through a sadhana. But outer vigor is also required to help people come to Krishna, help come, people come to the Lord. So, Maam Anusmara Yudhyacha, the Bhagavad Gita says. Maam Anusmara is improve your inner thoughts. But Yudhyacha is fight to, we may not have to fight a physical war, 
but fight whatever challenges we face in life so that the service that we are doing manifests in the form of tangible results so now i'll talk about this how the remembrance of the lord actually removes obstacles from our heart now when hanuman went in the search of sita as i said in the valmiki ramayan there is in the sundar kand there is not much presence of lord ram directly but when hanuman comes back after going to lanka now he has been told to find sita he not only find sita he gives a warning to ravan and not just a warning in words he gives a warning through actions he burns nearly half of lanka the point is not wanton violence the point is deterrence that ravan is thinking what can this human and monkey do to me but he want to show him how powerful they are and when he comes back it's like say we are told we have to go and distribute at least 50 books and somebody goes and distribute 5000 books oh it's extraordinary so lord lord ram comes lord ram hears about what hanuman has done he becomes so delighted the sri vishnu commentators they describe that ram is thinking you know what what can i give to hanuman he has done such service what he says i have i am a i am a pauper right now i have been exiled i have nothing with me there's nothing i can give except except i can express my gratitude with an embrace and then he pulls hanuman into that embrace you may have seen that iconic image in our Krish, in our krishna bhagavata mart it is there now hanuman is being embraced by ram and when hanum when the lord offers his embrace at that time what is hanuman thinking hanuman is thinking that this form of the lord is actually the shelter of the goddess of fortune this is the greatest treasure in the entire existence there is nothing of as much value as the form of the lord and he feels completely satisfied ultimately enriched by that embrace of the lord so that embrace is in one sense the ultimate reward for hanuman for all the services that he has done and when we talk about that the lord embracing the devotee the let me basically the lord is pleased extremely pleased so while the ramayan goes through various deliberations about what is the right thing to do its conclusion in one sense is that the right thing to do is that which will please the lord samsiddhir haritoshanam and hanuman demonstrates that pleasing of the lord so dharma can sometimes be very complex how oh, should i do this or should i do that should I, should i act in this way or that way but the gita also concludes in para dharma para dharma is that that which pleases krishna that sarva dharman parityajya mam ekam sharanam raj so now we may say that how do i know what will please krishna that is why we have the process of bhakti in this process of bhakti we get guidance from our guru we get guidance from our very shiksha gurus we ourselves practice sadhana but overall if our intention is krishna i want to do that which will please you then the lord becomes pleased so hanuman demonstrates that desire to please the lord and because he has that desire krishna says in the bhagavad gita tadami buddhi yogam tam yena mam upayanti te that i will give you the intelligence by which you can come to me so at various points in life uh, where when we are lost knowing not not knowing not what am i meant to do at that time if we just remember the lord and try to have that service attitude the lord will remove obstacles 
This is illustrated especially in the search for Sita that Hanuman does. And so Hanuman has gone to Lanka. It's been a stupendous mission. He has single-handedly leapt across, overcome many obstacles, then sneaked into Lanka, managed to remain undetected, and searched through all the palaces. And he can't find Sita anywhere. And he's sinking into the depths of despair. See, generally, the more effort we put in doing something, the more invested we become in it. And then, if we think there's no result coming over here, it, it can become very depressing. Okay, if we try something and it doesn't work, we just go for a program in the neighborhood and nobody comes for the program, that's okay. But if we travel from one corner of the world to another program, corner of the world to, to try to share Krishna Bhakti, we have put in a lot of effort and then no result comes. It can be very disheartening. So Hanuman is getting disheartened. He searched everywhere. He's wondering what has happened. Has Ravan devoured Sita? Has Sita ended her life in hopelessness that she's not going to be rescued? What am I going to do? He has searched in the darkness of the night and still it's dark. There was a moon before, but the moon is clouded now and there is darkness all around and the darkness outside reflects the darkness in his heart where he just doesn't know what to do and he starts thinking. There's a very human-like depiction of the thought process of Hanuman. He starts thinking that if I can't find Sita, what is going to happen? Is how can I go back and face Lord Ram and tell him I couldn't find Sita? If I tell that to Lord Ram, no, he will not be able to live. He will end his life. If he ends his life, then Sugriva won't be able to live. If Sugriva ends his life, then the entire Kishkinda, the entire monkey kingdom will not be able to survive. If Lord Ram ends his life, then Bharat in Ayodhya will not be able to survive. If Bharat doesn't survive, then the entire Ayodhya will not be able to survive because of separation from Ram and Bharat. It is in this way, he says, my failure to find Sita will lead to two entire kingdoms being destroyed. He says, I cannot let that happen. He says, I will rather die trying to find Sita than go back. When in the depth of that darkness, that resolve comes. That I am going to keep trying whether I succeed or fail. He just holds on to that determination. And at that time, suddenly, the clouds part. And the moon comes. And the moon, although it's setting, still its rays are bright. And in the last setting rays of the moon, he sees there is a garden nearby. He starts thinking, hey, I have searched all the palaces, but I haven't searched any gardens. And it is in that garden that he finds Sita. So, oh, we see when Shula Prabhupada also came to America. Prabhupada actually came on a two-month visa. And he initially was trying and nothing seemed to be working. And Prabhupada told at times, that many times when he would think, you know, maybe I should just go back. And Prabhupada waited and tried and waited and tried. And in one sense, the moment of the darkest uh, distress for him was when he was attacked by his roommate, this David Ellen, who was supposed to become his disciple and suddenly, in a drug-induced mania, he attacked Prabhupada. And Prabhupada had to just leave. He was on the streets as homeless as all the Hippies lying on the ground, as homeless as the birds on the tree, roofs of the homes, the crowds there. And Prabhupada, at that time, could easily have gone back. But Prabhupada said, let me try. I want to do something. And then uh, Prabhupada said, there are some students coming to his place. So Prabhupada called one of those students. Prabhupada called Mukund Ma Michael Grand, who became Mukund Maharaj. And then Prabhupada relocated to another place. And at that place, slowly more people and serious people started coming. 
So that particular thing, that tadgati vigna, there will be obstacles in the path of everyone in life. Tadgati vigna, dhamsa karama. If we just maintain our remembrance of the Lord, my dear Lord, I want to serve you. Shri Prabhupada would say the best prayer that we can offer to the Lord is, my dear Lord, how can I serve you? It is not that I don't want to serve you. I want to serve you, but I don't know how. How can I serve you? So if we have that mood, this is Hanuman was empowered, we will also be empowered. And that brings me to the last part. So the bhakti mood is that, no matter how big the obstacles are there in this world, the Lord is bigger. The Lord can remove obstacles. Just as he did for Hanuman, just as he did for Srila Prabhupada. And the last part is, from the Gaudiya Vaishna perspective, I'll just speak one point over here. The, see, the Gaudiya Vaishna, while well, Gaudiya Vaishna is a vast philosophy, but the key principle is that presence in absence. That is the essence of the Gaudiya Vaishnavism, that the Lord, when he is absent, that is when his presence becomes more and more manifest in the heart. So when the gopis are separated from Krishna because Krishna has gone away from them, at that time, Krishna actually enters deeper and deeper into their hearts. So that same mood is there in the Valmiki Ramayana and the Sundar Kant. Like I said, what is so beautiful about the Sundar Kant? Why is it so attractive? From a dramatic point of view, it's adventurous what a single Hanuman does. But from a devotional perspective, it is the time when Hanuman meets Sita and Hanuman starts speaking the glories of Ram. Now Sita is in the clutches of, clutches of the demons. And once she has already fallen prey to the disguise of someone, Ravan came disguised as a sage. And therefore she's careful, she's leery, so suspicious to some extent. And when here, this person, this strange creature is here and he says, I'm a messenger of Ram. Sita is naturally suspicious. So what does she do? Well, Hanuman do? Hanuman starts singing the past times of Ram. And as he keeps speaking, keeps speaking, he starts from generally known pastimes toward more and more intimate pastimes. And eventually when he speaks a pastime, that is known only as the interaction between her and Ram that even Lakshman does not know. When Hanuman speaks that, that is the time when Sita is convinced. He is sent by Ram. And then when both of them meet and both of them talk, at that time, the greatest devotee of, the greatest devotee of Ram and the greatest servant of Ram, the consort of Ram and the servant of Ram, both of them meet. And that is the time, in the absence of Lord Ram, his presence is felt the most. So that love in separation, that presence in absence, is manifested even in the, uh, in the Ramayana to some extent. And for us, as Gaudiya Vaishnavas, the Goswamis explain that among the various avatars, Krishna is the greatest because the love is manifest the most, but there are other Paravastha avatars, Narsimha and Rama. So one, aspect, one reason why Rama is especially special is because that intimate mood of love is there. And when Srila Prabhupada, he came to America, he left just before Janmashtami, he celebrated Janmashtami on the ship. And then he came to America, the first Gaur Purnima that he celebrated over here. Uh, he, he writes in his diary that all my God brothers in Mayapur and Rindavan, will be relishing the glories of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, but I am all alone over here. Nobody knows even about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. But, he says, I am here because it is the mission of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the mission of my Guru Maharaj. So Prabhupada said, I have never felt even for one moment separated from my spiritual master. Prabhupada explained that presence in absence. That is experience through the attitude of service. When we are eager to serve the Lord, then even if we are far away from the Lord, we experience His presence. So just as Hanuman experienced the enriching presence and then eventually was rewarded by the embrace of the Lord. So for us, that embrace may be far away. In our tradition also it is described 
in the brihad bhagavata amruta when the gop kumar goes back to the spiritual world at that time the lord embraces him in fact it is described the lord becomes so ecstatic and on seeing the gop kumar the lord faints so like krishna loses his krishna consciousness <laughs> right that embrace is waiting for all of us the lord wants us to be united with him till that time it is our aspiration to experience presence in absence to cultivate devotion in separation and through so to lord ram we all can pray that he blesses us with that same devotion that same strength that he blessed hanuman with so I'll quickly summarize i discussed three main points today we discussed from a vedic perspective that what is the concept of the avatar avatar descends to inspire the human ascent so it is not just establish order here dharma here but it is inspire prema love bhakti cultivating in love that's the broad vedic understanding now within that the vaishnava understanding is that when we go up bhakti it is not just for merging it is not at all for merging in fact it is for serving eternally and in this service the lord empowers the devotee so that empowers devotee that means the devotee does wonderful things that that empowerment of the devotee we saw in hanuman's mood of he has his folded hands convey his shakti and then sorry his folded hands convey his bhakti and the mace in his hand conveys his shakti his strength so we want to bring about inner change in our hearts and in the mood of service we also want to bring about outer change and then i discuss from the gaudiya vaishnava perspective so that its presence in absence love in separation that is the essential mood so we discuss how hanuman and when hanuman and sita meet that is like the devotional culmination the climax highest richest presence of the lord is there now eventually there will be the embrace that comes the eternal embrace of the lord will be there but till we get to that embrace the service in separation is what we all need to cultivate so if we will all face many obstacles in our lives but if we maintain the remembrance of the lord the lord will guide us through all those obstacles to attain him ultimately so let's recite once more this verse and we'll conclude kapi together kapi var santat samsprit ram tad gati vigna dhamsak ram shri ramachandra bhagwan ki jai shri prabhupad ki jai gaur bhakt vrind ki jai tai gaur premanand thank you so much hare krishna Do we have time for questions? Yes, yes sir. We have a mic or you can speak. Thank you very much for your wonderful presentation. Uh this last part about presence in absence and so wonderful. I still have to work out how to understand this better. So it appears that here in the material world we go through all this and we highlight the separation of Krishna. then we see that even uh, you know when when lord machandra leaves uh, hanuman still stays here He stays in one of the in one of the uh, how do you call um, realms in the material world in service then uh we also hear the other part where you mentioned gopakumara was like going and finally he meets krishna in a big embrace 
So it may appear sometimes, this is my own, try to figure out, that when Gopakumara is embraced by Krishna, it's like the culmination of all that struggle. And it's, it appears that it's ending. So now, in the material world, it's a lot of struggle, but you feel the presence of the Lord more. So my question is, isn't it, like in the, in the spiritual world, it appears that, well, you, you're already there. There's no more struggle, Krishna is there. So it appears that actually being in the material world through all this we, is more higher than, <laughs> than <laughs> okay. there. Good question. Thank you. So I was going to speak that point, but see, there is separation from the Lord. Now, there is, first we could say this is the material world and then we have the spiritual world. In the spiritual world, sorry, in the material world, the separation is because of our desires. Hmm? It is our, our desires that separate us from the Lord. But in the spiritual world, the separation is because of Krishna's desires. So, Krishna, in general, what he does is, he creates arrangements by which there is some some obstacle in the union between the devotee and the Lord. So when it is because of our desires, we need to purify ourselves. And so when we are talking about love in separation, we are our presence and absence. It is we have we have gone away from Krishna and we need to go closer toward Krishna. I was once giving a class in India and I was telling the Vrajvasis don't accept that Krishna is God. And they don't consider Krishna to be God. And one person in the audience raised his hand, he says, I also don't consider Krishna to be God. <laughs> <laughs> so, I said with all due respect, generally anybody says with all due respect, that means what is going to be spoken is not going to be very respectful afterwards. <laughs> I said, with all due respect, the Brajivasis, when they don't consider Krishna to be God, that is because of their transcendence. If we don't consider Krishna to be God, that is because of our ignorance. <laughs> not transcendence. <laughs> so, here, uh, by our desires, when we are separated from the Lord, then, then we try to cultivate, uh, recognize that Krishna is present as the Paramatma in our hearts, even when he is not there, Krishna is present as the holy name. So we try to cultivate presence in his absence. And from here, say we could say in the spiritual world, there is union. Hmm? We will move from the separation towards union by rectifying our desires. From the desire to enjoy separately from Krishna, from the, to the desire to serve Krishna. But now, within the spiritual world, there can be a dynamism. That is, there is union and then there is separation. So Krishna does not delight simply in displaying his Godhood. Krishna is not, I am God and you bow down to me eternally. Krishna wants dynamic love. And going back to the movie example, generally, if for any movie to be interesting, there has to be some conflict. There has to be some opposition. If, say, the hero and heroine meet each other and they, they just attract each other and they are happily ever after, then there is not much interest in it. So if there is no tension, there is no attention. <laughs> there has to be some tension. So now in the spiritual world, there is no tension, there is no opposition. Krishna is God and everybody loves Krishna. But Krishna creates that opposition. So Krishna has some devotees play roles that are apparently opposed to him. So some of the family members or relatives of Radharani, they apparently act as inimical. So that's why the union between Radharani and Krishna doesn't happen so frequently. So, in that sense, they, is it that here it's better? No, it's not better over here. Because here, we, are, we all have worldly desires. And if those desires are not purified, sometimes we may experience presence in absence. But sometimes we will only experience absence. And no presence at all. So, I'll conclude with one example for this. That, see, that love and separation or separation does to love hmm? uh, what wind does to fire. 
Now, if there's a forest fire, the worst nightmare of firefighters is if a wind comes. So, like that, when there is a forest fire like love for Krishna, separation increases that love. But our love, so the gopi's love, the devotee's love in the spiritual world is like the forest fire. But our love is not like a forest fire. It is like a candle fire. <laughs> so, when there is separation, that's like a wind. And the wind, when it comes to a candle, it will just extinguish the candle. <laughs> so, that's why, yes, we need to stay in association. We need to consciously cultivate the connection with Krishna. Okay? Thank you. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. We'll stop now. Any other questions? Do you have any comments? So, basically, in the spiritual world, um, the gopis are always put in that situation of separation. And so, you're saying Krishna arranges that situation? Yes. So, then, so, okay, so it builds up into a crescendo where he actually, they see him. Yes. Now, is that ecstasy increased at that particular junction? I mean, is, is, is there some elevated experience I'm, I'm just asking a question because yeah, it just you made question. me think like that. So it's a good question. Yeah, definitely. See, when there is love for someone, and we meet that person, naturally there is joy. So definitely the gopis are ecstatic when they meet Krishna. But when we say love in separation is highest, what it means actually, I think in the Bhakti Sutra that is described that the test of true love, it comes in the Mahabharata similar words that the test of true love is. When there is every reason to give up the object of love and one doesn't give up that object. You know, two people are in a relationship, both of them quarrel with each other and they say, just forget it, okay, quit the relationship. But when there is reason to give up the person we love and we don't give up, that is the real love. So what happens is when you say love in separation, what is so glorious about it is that a devotee loves Krishna, a devotee wants to be with Krishna, but Krishna goes away from that devotee. Like the gopis, that's what they're praying in the Gopi Gita, that Krishna, you called us and we left our family. Pati sutanvaya bhratra bandhavan ati vilangyate antya chutagata. We gave up all our family. And at those times, for a woman to leave her family to go into the forest, that's like committing social suicide. She would be disgraced completely. So the gopis give everything up to come to Krishna. And what does Krishna do? Kitava yoshitas kastya nishi. That, how can you give us up at night? You know, if a boy and a girl are trying to develop a relationship and the boy says, let us run away together. We'll meet at this particular place. And the girl does everything and comes over there and the boy doesn't turn up over there only. Then, the girl will say, I'll have nothing to do with you afterwards. Isn't it? So, the gopis give up everything for Krishna and Krishna apparently gives them up and goes away. But the gopis don't become bitter. The gopis never abandon Krishna. And that is the greatness of their love. So we say love in separation is the highest. So definitely, when in terms of experience of happiness, when the gopis are united with Krishna, the happiness is much greater for them in terms of what they experience. But when they are separated from Krishna, their love is shown that much. Just like you know, when two people, they love each other, they meet each other, they run together, they are very happy, they are smiling, they embrace each other, that shows their love. But two people are separated for a long, long time and still one person is still remembering the other person, trying to care for the other person, serving that other person. That also shows love in a different way. So, a love in separation, in the broader sense is considered higher because it is a greater test of love. But in terms of experience of happiness, it is a union that is, that is especially joyful. So in fact, the separation is in one sense painful. The gopis are in distress. So it's like when there is, at one level, you could say remembrance of the Lord. That is itself spiritual happiness. It's like nectar. But within remembrance of the Lord, there can be remembrance in union and there can be remembrance in separation. So, now remembrance in union is like sweet nectar. Remembrance in separation is like bitter nectar. And we say, how can nectar be bitter? It is nectar. It is life-giving. The 
Chaitanya Charitamrita gives the example of hot sugar cane juice. It is sugar cane juice, it's delicious, one can't stop drinking. But it's hot, I can't bear it. So there is that complex experience of like agony and ecstasy. So the gopis when they are separated from Krishna, the remembrance of Krishna becomes more and more intense. And because the remembrance of Krishna is intense, so you could say there is ecstasy. But because there is separation, there is agony. So it is it's like agony is there, but the foundation is because there is remembrance of Krishna, there is ecstasy. So on the other hand, when there is forgetfulness of Krishna, maybe that happens in this material world, now, within that there can be happiness. There are times when materially we enjoy, there are times when there is unhappiness. But it's like the forgetfulness of Krishna itself is like poison. So you could say happiness in this material world is like sweet poison. Distress in the material world is like bitter poison. <laughs> so rather than focusing on the taste, is it sweet or better? We focus on the overall effect. So remembrance of Krishna in that sense is always uplifting. It's nectary in that sense. So nectar, just to, sorry to conclude, nectar has two connotations, you know. One is its taste and its effect. Nectar is that which grants immortality, that which brings life. But nectar is also which tastes good. So remembrance of Krishna is nectar in this sense of effect. In terms of taste, remembrance of Krishna may not always bring, uh, may not be uh, joyful at the manifest level. Like Prabhupada told Tamal Krishna Maharaj, your anxiety for serving Krishna will take you to Krishna. When the Juhu temple problems were coming up. So anxiety is not a very relishable emotion. But that anxiety is deepening the connection with Krishna. How about anticipation? Oh yes. <laughs> yeah. So you can say anxiety in one sense is, is a form of anticipation only. We are so eager. So for us love in separation is filled with that anticipation of that union. Yes. Thank you. That's a beautiful word. So, Shri Ramachandra Bhagavan Ki Jai. Shri Ram Nami Maha Mahotsar Ki Jai. That's where you want to go. That's, 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 that